sisters and brothers in Christ, hear these important words from the Hebrew scriptures. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there, on the surface of the wilderness, was a fine, flaky substance as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Meat at night, manna, from heaven in the morning. That is what God gave to God's people in need. You might argue that Jesus was manna from heaven as well. Manna given to God's people that they might come to know God. Know God. Not just in their minds and in their intellect, but in their hearts as well that they might become more intimate with God, more trusting of God. That will be the theme of our service this morning. Eating manna and knowing God. So come, draw closer to Creator, who loves you and sustains you. Let me offer you now some evidence of how I think God is active and engaged in the present world and time. This past week, Mary Simon became Canada's first Indigenous Governor General. Mary is an Inuk from Kujuak in northeastern Quebec, who took her official oaths last Monday in a ceremony at the, ceremony at the Senate chamber in Ottawa. How many hearts did God open along the way to this event happening? How many doors did God pry, push, and pull open to get us all to this point? The ceremony in Ottawa was beautiful, and marked what I hope is a watershed moment in Canadian history and the struggle for Indigenous rights in Canada. I can only pray that history one day will mark the event as yet another definitive step taken toward final reconciliation between all the peoples who call this great land home. Now, I know that the land on which our church sits is land that has been walked on, hunted on, and lived on for thousands of years. It is the traditional land of the Three Fires Confederacy, including the Ojibwe, Odawa, Potawatomi, and Huron-Wendat peoples. And it is with humility and respect that we give thanks that we are here. 
in a space where we are in touch with creator who made it and made us. May our worship honor the relationships that are celebrated and invited here. And may we always remember the story of this land. The people who live here and God's call to each one of us to live with respect and thanksgiving. The flame of this candle reminds us of the presence and the beauty of the light that paints the sky, bathes the land, and lightens our path. Thanks be to Creator for fire and sun, for flame and symbol, for manna from heaven, for the light and presence of Christ. Amen. Let us now join the Ebenezer Church Choir of Markham, Ontario in singing a hymn from the Moore Voices hymnal called Deep in Our Hearts. Margita will now play the beautiful hymn, the beautiful anthem, Here I Am, Lord, and this arrangement by Mark Hayes.
Margita, that's one of my favorite, favorite hymns, and you played it so beautifully. Thank you. Thank you for that. And now a reading from the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to John. This event took place on the day following, following the great feeding of the 5,000 that I referenced last week. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God his Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now I think it's true that most followers of Jesus come back to him again and again. And from different angles seeking to better understand him. The crowd, who just the day before witnessed Jesus feed 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves of bread, have crossed the Sea of Galilee to learn more about Jesus' identity, about who he is, and from where he came. They have so many more questions to ask him. Even Jesus' disciples aren't quite sure what to make of him. They too are trying to get a fix on the mystery that is Jesus. And they're using the best tools their Jewish religion have to offer to do so. Like any good critical thinker, they analyze Jesus' signs and miracles as he performs them. They contrast Jesus and his teaching with Judaism's religious traditions, don't they? And they consult the Hebrew scriptures. But for peoples and crowds, everywhere and in every time, Jesus and his teachings can be difficult to comprehend, let alone apply. As I said, I think that most followers of Jesus come back to him again and again and from different angles, seeking to better answer the question Jesus asks of all of us. 
Who do you say I am? I don't think anyone can answer that question fully. And with the same measure of certainty, one might answer the question, how much is two plus two? I don't think anyone, anyone at all, fully comprehends the enigma, the perplexity, and the mystery that is Jesus. It's just that I think some people like to think they do. I confess that I have more questions than answers when it comes to most things, Jesus and God. Many of the words that Jesus speaks, especially about himself, I still find puzzling and challenging. Dive deep into another book on the subject, and I'm bound to resurface with a hundred more questions than when I started. It should come as no surprise then when I say that I am definitely one of those followers of Jesus who comes to him again and again, seeking to better understand him, or better know him, or have stronger faith in him, however you want to put it. But I stand in good company. At the time Jesus was alive, people didn't get what Jesus meant when he said that after all the stones were thrown down, he would, quote unquote, rebuild the temple in three days. People at first didn't get the meaning of new birth or living water. Just as they didn't get all this talk about life-giving bread. The day before, the day before, the crowd saw Jesus fill 5,000 stomachs with what they thought was quote-unquote life-giving bread. And so, when the crowd hears Jesus on bread now, they assume he's talking about grub. They simply don't understand. It's no wonder when Jesus offers them life-giving bread from heaven, they respond, Sir, Give us this bread always. Understandably, their thoughts are centered on food that perishes. Namely, physical food. Bread, fish, barley, and the like. Which leads me to think, which leads me to think that too often our thoughts are fixed on food that perishes as well. On what we can get from God now to enrich in our lives even more. Even to the extent, I think, of praying in silence, please God, please, give us all that you can now. We will consume all we want today and then store up the rest for later. So question. Any wonder that God provided only enough manna for a day? That if anyone tried to keep it overnight, it would spoil or perish? You might say that deep down we have always favored a religion that satisfies our wants. Over one that would make us work, work hard for the quote unquote food that endures. 
I believe that. We favor a religion that condones hyper-consumerism and competition. That equates prosperity and status with being more in favor with God than our neighbors. <laughs> we favor a religion that sees praying for something good to occur as being enough, as somehow replacing God's call to us to actually work at making that good occur. God's call to us to be the active hands and feet of God in a world that needs good to occur. We favor a religion that lives for the most part in the background. One that quietly allows us to put our own needs or our family's needs or our country's needs or our racist needs above the needs of others. Human beings have long thought that their relationship with God is akin to some sort of transaction on a large scale. Some sort of huge lobbying effort, I think. It's as if we were saying to God, I give so that you will give. It's why in verse 28 of the passage, the people ask Jesus, what must we do to perform the works of God? In other words, what must we do so you will do for us? Now on one level, works of God include, I think, the, of course, the miraculous deeds of grace and mercy that Jesus performs for others. At a deeper level, though, you can say they constitute his entire mission to the world, including dying on a cross. Works of God. You might even say, that performing works of God defined his life, defined his purpose. Why? His very being. Jesus was all about God and doing works of God. Right? He was so filled with God's spirit, God's dabar, that he could live no other way. He could live no other way. And believe it or not, folks, our calling is to follow that same way. God's way. But there's no grand transaction here. No huge lobbying effort involved. No, I give so you will give idea. What Jesus wants is that we believe him and in him. That we have faith, faith in him and in his way of living. Indeed, that we trust, trust him completely. More than, and I have to emphasize this, more than believe facts or propositions or theories about Jesus, Jesus asks that we trust in our hearts that his way, God's way, is the best way for us to live our lives. Period. Point final. And he demands that we as Christians, as Christians, commit 
to his way. That's what the baptismal font means. The font that sits over there. So in the end, where are we in all this? Where are we? Are we, in fact, back where we started? Still trying to answer the question Jesus asks of us all, namely, who do you say that I am? Maybe. But so be it. I can live in the mystery a wee bit longer. But I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. Setting aside all the heady stuff, I know, I know in my heart of hearts that Jesus is for me. For me, the eternal, imperishable, life-giving bread I cherish. Jesus is for me manna from heaven. Not to be stored up, but to be savored each and every day. Jesus and his way of living constitute the eternal food I want to ingest every day. The eternal food that drives my very being. The eternal food, the, the imperishable food, the spiritual nourishment, if you will, that I need to survive and help me live his way. I don't need any more proof than what my heart is telling me. Jesus is the one for me. And so I commit. I commit to living his way. I do. I commit to making his story my story. I do. I commit to doing as best I can to live a loving life in and for God. and to the benefit of others. A life filled with, this is what I dream, this is what I want so deeply, a life filled with kindness and with compassion, integrity, dedication, patience and courage. A life devoted to the realization of justice in the world. That was Jesus' way. And I commit myself to it. Will you? If so, let's eat. As I further prepare our meal, Please join Jim and Jean Strathby and friends in singing a hymn in Voices United called There's a Spirit in the Air. Break the bread when a hungry child. 
We are now set to celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion, a sacrament in which everyone is welcome to participate. Now, if you haven't got your elements of bread and juice with you, I suggest that you get them now. Time to run to the fridge. Simply pause the recording and then hit play when you get back. And I promise we'll still be here waiting for you. As I like to say, no one, no one is excluded from this table. No matter who you are, no matter what you may have done. We are reminded that this is not the table of this congregation. Nor is it the table of the United Church of Canada or any other denomination. This is the table of Jesus Christ. All who seek to be nourished and sustained in their journey of faith and long to live justly and in peace with their neighbor are welcome here. When Jesus sat at tables and broke bread with tax collectors and lawyers and rich elites and poor peasants. He proclaimed that God's gracious love knows no bounds. Through these occasions of sharing food, women and men experienced God and shared in God's kingdom. A kingdom where all are welcome, worthy, and invited where lives are transformed and empowered, and where the fruits of God's gentle justice bloom, bloom throughout all creation. All people, including each of us, are invited to share in this sacred meal of celebration and be strengthened by the presence of God wherever we are at. Let us pray. We remember that Jesus fed 5,000 hungry people with five loaves of bread and two fish. At this miraculous meal, there was such an abundance of food that everyone ate until they were full. And there were even 12 baskets of food left over. Holy God, we celebrate your abundant care and solidarity revealed in this meal. We remember that Jesus joined a great banquet with Levi, the despised tax collector. And despite the complaints of some, Jesus welcomed Levi and invited him to repent and enjoy a fresh beginning at life. Holy God, we celebrate your transforming presence revealed in this meal. We remember that while sharing a meal with Pharisees, Jesus welcomed a woman viewed as an outsider. As the woman anointed his feet with oil, Jesus declared her dignity before everyone at the meal. Holy God, we celebrate your gracious inclusiveness revealed in this meal. At these meals, Jesus and the women and men who were his disciples resisted the divisions, injustice, and violence of society. 
They lived out an alternative reality, the kingdom of God, a place of love, justice, and mutuality. Today, we celebrate these meals and ministries. But we also recognize that not all people liked Jesus' ministry. In fact, for some people, it was scandalous. They said, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. As we know, Jesus' life quickly became endangered. When his arrest seemed near, Jesus ate a meal in an upper room with his disciples. As he had done so many times before, he took bread, and after giving thanks to you, holy God, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, he shared wine gave thanks and said, I will not drink from this cup again until I drink it with you in the kingdom of God. Jesus was then unjustly killed by the systems of domination and oppression of his day. To some of his frightened disciples, it seemed that the bread symbolized the broken body and the wine his blood. It also seemed like injustice and violence had killed Jesus and his ministry. But the resurrection provided new hope. There were more meals and more ministries. We thank you, holy God, that the Last Supper wasn't the last meal or the last word. At an evening meal in Emmaus, Jesus once again ate with his disciples. His execution wasn't the end. His presence and ministry continued in a new way. Jesus once more took bread, and having given thanks to you, holy God, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, revealing that your steadfast love is stronger than death. And your ministry with us, for the sake of your kingdom, continues. The kingdom persisted and persists today through the many women and men who seek to be your resurrection community. Despite the divisions, the violence, and the injustice in the world, God continually brings forth renewed hope, renewed hope, for love, justice, and mutuality to and through each of us. Therefore, holy God, in the sharing of this bread and wine, we joyfully celebrate the hope-inspiring ministry and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Gracious God, may this meal be for us an Emmaus meal, where we encounter your presence in the sharing of this food, as the disciples did at their meal in Emmaus. May the sharing of this food also be a taste of your kingdom that we may be strengthened to be your joyful and hopeful disciples. And may we share in your kingdom of love, justice, and mutuality with those around us. Let us share the meal now, each in our own place, wherever that may be. And may we resolve to be the joyful and hopeful disciples God would have us be. Can we do that? Let us pray. 
Holy God, bless each of us and the meal we will share. That we may be open to your abiding presence, nourished by your gracious love, and strengthened by your resurrection power. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Pray with me. Amazing God, we thank you for your presence in this place. We also thank you for giving us a taste of your kingdom in this meal. May this food strengthen us to be your joyful and hopeful resurrection community, sharing and experiencing your kingdom of love and justice. Flow through us, healing God, Flow through us, we pray. Amen. The bread of life, eat and be filled. The cup of salvation. Drink and be satisfied. Amen. The closing hymn of our service this morning is Seek Ye First the Kingdom. This rendition by Ingrid Dumash and the London Fox Singers. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you
Folks, this concludes our service this morning. As I like to remind you each and every week, please, please be safe and be well. If you haven't yet been vaccinated, please do so as soon as possible. And then make it your mission to encourage your friends or loved ones, any of them who may not have gotten vaccinated, who may be vaccination hesitant. Vaccines save lives. Yours and the lives of all those around you. And as you journey through the coming week, may the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk the road with you. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open your hearts to love. May you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet. And may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. Go in peace. Thank you.